Well, it's good to have you all with us this morning. Now, I, I just want to kind of give you a, a quick little idea of where we're going in the new year here. We are starting a brand new series on January 6th called Transformed. And every year we always pick kind of a theme for our year, something that we're going to really focus in on for, for our, our year and spiritual growth and, and just growth as a church in general and all those kind of things. And, and so this year we, kind of, we, we picked the theme, Transformed. And so we're going to start with a series called Transformed. Now every year at the first of the year we do a church-wide kind of campaign and everything else. So one thing, if you are planning or would like to open up your home to host a small group. We really need some here in Marshfield. We have, we have like two in Granton. We've got some somewhere else. And, but we don't have any here in Marshfield. And our church is in Marshfield. It would be really nice to have one here in Marshfield, don't you think? So somebody can open their home. Well, right after church today, right downstairs in the cafe, we're going to have just a quick, I know it's December 23rd. I know it's like, oh, man, Pastor... I, it's 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes of your time. That's all I'm going to ask for. And I know what you're thinking. You've never said anything in 10 minutes, Pastor. And you're probably right. So I'm not going to guarantee that it'll be 10 minutes. But uh, come down. It'll be a quick, short little meeting. We're just going to kind of set you up a little bit because we'll have another meeting the following week about it and everything else. We want to get you set up, let you know what's coming up, let you know what's going to look like. But go ahead and watch this video here to kind of introduce it a little bit more. I bet there's some of you who even thought that you probably wouldn't even be alive by the year 2019. But you are! And we've got something exciting for you. Every year here at Calvary, we pick a theme. And this year's theme is Transform. So we're going to be starting January 6th, a brand new church-wide campaign called Transform. This is going to be a great opportunity for you to come and learn how Christ can transform your life. We have small groups that are going to be meeting throughout the week, so we hope that you'll sign up for one of those small groups. And we hope that you'll learn how to live a transformed life for Christ. All right, so if you want to open up your home to that, that would be fantastic. Let us know. It's not a hard thing to do. All, everything is video-based and video-driven, so we have DVDs for you and everything else, and we'll set you up as best as we can to be able to host one of those small groups. So anyways, back to what we're actually going to talk about today, which is this whole idea. We've been in this series called Advent, and, and this is an Advent year, and I've told you throughout the series that Advent is kind of a new thing for me to kind of talk our way through this particular subject and everything else. I know it's not new for a lot of you, but for me, it is. And, and I know that's odd, knowing that I grew up in church and everything else, but our church did never do Advent series and Advent reads and all these different things. I've been learning all kinds of stuff. And I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of fun kind of learning about this and understanding. And this kind of been our whole understanding of this series is to really know and understand the true story of Advent. So tomorrow night we're going to finish off this particular series with a sermon called The Invitation. And so really, we've been building all the way to Christmas Eve over these last four weeks. And tomorrow night, we're going to kind of finish that off. So if you don't have somewhere to already spend Christmas Eve, we'd love for you to come back here. We're going to have a, a great candlelight service for you. The kids are going to be singing. We've got to get our kids' choir is going to be singing. It's going to be a fun time. And those kids, let me tell you what, they've been practicing for quite a while now. And, and so they've been putting a lot of time and effort into this. And the least you could do is show up. Come on, people. So uh, show up tomorrow night because we're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be a great time. And then also, we, I know some of you got invites, but uh, we ran out of our Christmas Eve invites, so, which uh, we weren't planning on running out of them, but we ran out of them, which is a good thing, I hope. I mean, I, mean, I know some of you might have taken them home and thrown them away. Uh, I hope you didn't do that. I hope you got them into the hands of your friends, family, people you don't like. Uh, the person at McDonald's that took your order and messed it all up and everything else. I hope you got it into their hands and invited them to Christmas Eve anyways because it's going to be a great night. It's going to be a, a great time of just really kind of finishing out this talk on why Jesus had to come in the first place. And we're going to focus in on that tomorrow night and talk about that invitation. Also, I always say this every year, Christmas Eve 
is one of those Sundays throughout the year, or actually it's not on a Sunday this year, but Christmas Eve is one of those nights where it's a great time to invite. People are more open to coming to church at this time of year. I tell you this every single year. You got Christmas Eve and you got Easter. Those are two great times to get people to come through the doors just because they're more open to uh, this whole idea of, of God and church and the thinking about it and everything else. So once again, get those invites into people's hands. Invite them to come with you tomorrow night. Well, let's get into this today. I first said to you a few weeks ago as we started this series, I first said to you that as we talk about this whole idea of Advent, and we talk about this baby in a manger, that's not where you start the story. You can't start the story of Christmas with a baby in a manger. If you do, you're actually starting in the middle of the story. So to understand this story of a baby in a manger, you have to go all the way back to Genesis. That's where the whole story of a baby in a manger starts out. And I, told, and I talked to you that, that, that this whole idea of this gift of Jesus is really rooted in, in, in the grief in the heart of God. And it's also connected to grief in your heart. You see, God hears your cries, and the ultimate response is sending his son to this earth. We also look to the fact that an announcement of the angels and that song, that most familiar hymn that you hear sung as you go into department stores and everything else around Christmas time, you always hear that one song that always rings out, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace with whom he is pleased. We talked about the fact that that's not just an announcement of the birth of Jesus. We talked about the fact that it's also a prediction of his death. But I'd like to add just one more piece to that this morning. I'd like to do this by means of a question. Now, this is a rhetorical question, okay? So you don't have to feel the need to like answer it out loud or anything right now. But maybe you want to write it down on your notes. If you, if you came in, you got a set of notes, go ahead and pull those out. Maybe you want to write this down. And I want you to be honest with yourself this morning. Be honest with yourself, okay? If I were to ask you to write down on a piece of paper the top 10 things that bring you pleasure in life, what would it be? The top 10 things that bring you pleasure in life. Now, like I said, be honest. Don't feel the need here because you're sitting in church to be super spiritual, okay? Don't feel that need. I want you to be honest. Be honest with yourself this morning. What would bring you pleasure? What does bring you pleasure in life? Now, if you would look back at the end of a day and you would say to yourself, wow, that was a really great day, why would you say that? I mean, what, what would bring you to the point of saying, wow, that was a really great day? You come to the end of your week and you say, man, that was really a great week. Why would you say that? I mean, what really brings you pleasure? Now, I'd like to confess to you this morning that the only things in life that bring me pleasure are all rooted in spirituality, but I can't say that, not honestly. Not honestly. You know, we come to this time of Christmas, and I love Christmas. I really do. And I love Christmas for all the right reasons, and I love Christmas for all the not-so-right reasons. Uh, I told Miss the other day, I, 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 I shouldn't tell you this, but I, I put on a pair of jeans and I went, well, I can tell it's Christmas. I've put on weight. It's incredible how much weight you can put on this stuff. I love Christmas cookies. Who else loves Christmas cookies? You know, all shapes. Yeah, I got a few people raising hell. The rest of you are a bunch of liars. <laughs> Even my brother, Philip, who was this fitness nut, says, I ate a Christmas cookie yesterday. He ate one. He's got self-control. I don't have any self-control. When it comes to Christmas cookies, I mean, we take these things, we bake them. Missy, I took the kids, uh, Taylor's birthday was on Friday. And I took the kids yesterday along with a friend, and we went roller skating. That's what she wanted to do, which was really thankful that that's what she wanted to do because some wonderful people here at Calvary Bible Church gave me gift certificates to Melody Gardens. And so we used them yesterday. It was wonderful. And we got to bless not only my kids, but somebody else, which was which was fantastic. And and the other little girl we took with us, she went went and won all this these I mean she can't I was just like, I played one game and won three hundred tickets and she's walking this whole line of stuff. And she bought me little dice that go on my mirror for my truck. She says, I just wanted to thank you for letting me come with you. I'm like, sweet. 
So I told her I'm going to put the dice in my truck uh, just because she did that for me. I thought that was really cool. But yesterday, Missy spent a whole day, you know, Missy said, it would be okay if you took the kids and I stayed home and continued to bake and all that. So of course, I mean, I'm not going to turn that down at all. And so I came home and she had bags and bags and bags and bags of cookies and these little, I don't know what you call them, but these little things and they taste amazing. And I ate 400 of them last night, I think, which didn't even touch how many there actually are. But I love Christmas because I love Christmas for the not so right reasons sometimes. You know, I love the Christmas trees as we decorate Missy. We, We get a Christmas tree every year. We get a real one. Uh, Because that's really the only way to go, if you ask me. But we get a real one. And uh, and it leaves a terrible mess all over your house. And Missy and I were talking about it last night. And I said, why do we ever buy a Christmas tree? We're never home for Christmas. Because as soon as tomorrow night's done, we're jumping in a car and driving straight to Chicago. As soon as we're done with Christmas Eve service, we'll get there, I don't know, one, two in the morning. It's going to be a crazy night. I thought, why do we do that? Because we like it. We like to see that beautiful Christmas tree decorated. We like to see the candles in the windows. We like to see all those decorations all around. I love Christmas because we get to have family together, right? Family gets together on Christmas. And those are the things that bring me pleasure. But here's what I want you to understand. That this magnificent story that we've been considering really is connected to pleasure in the heart of God. And when you get that, it changes the way you think about the story. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles if you have one with you this morning. If not, it is in your notes. It'll be on the screen. But if you have a Bible, we encourage you to get one open. There's some in your pews there for you to turn and open with. Turn them to Isaiah in chapter 53. Now, you, you hear Isaiah 53 and you generally think, well, that's the passage of Scripture we look at at Easter time, not not Christmas. But we're going to spend our time talking about this this morning because this is really this whole idea of of the suffering, of the coming Messiah. And this is one of those verses that's what I call in Scripture a says-it-all kind of verse. This verse just says it all. It really is a a capsule of the story. And And it's a verse that you could probably, as you're reading through Isaiah 53, it'd be very easy to just kind of skip over this verse. You're reading all of these amazing things about Jesus. And Isaiah 53. And then you come to verse 10. And it's a very easy verse to kind of skip over. Before we look at the verse, I want to give you a bit of a principle that will not seem like it connects to the pleasure of God, but it will hopefully as we look at this verse, okay? And I put this in your notes. Give it to me up on the screen there for me. Uh, isn't there a bullet point before that one? Did I not put that in there? There it is. All right. All right. There is no clearer, greater, more pointed demonstration of the love of God than the offer of his son. I want you to get that point, and I want you to get that idea rooted into your head this morning. Okay? There is no clearer, more pointed, greater demonstration of the love of God than the offering of his son. Now let me read verse 10 for you. It says, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. Now, this is one of those verses that is really expansive. And if I were to take the time to really tear this verse apart this morning, we would be here till Tuesday, okay? So don't worry, because I'm only going to keep you till Monday, all right? And some of you are like, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have come to church today. But anyways, this is, this is one of those verses that, man, it's, it's really quite a deep verse. But I want to look at really just the first phrase this morning, okay? Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. You have to get your mind around and your heart open to the radical thing that this phrase is really trying to communicate to you. How could it be? How could it be that God the Father would ever find pleasure in crushing and the grief of his son. You know, that's what this verse communicates. That's what this verse communicates. And it's meant to stop you up short. It's meant for you to be reading through Isaiah 53 and for you to come to this verse and go, whoa, hold on a second, what in the world? It's meant to make you ask the question, how and why? How and why? If you're a parent in the room this morning, I want you to think with me for just a moment. Think of of the heart that you have for your children, right? 
Parents, you know, you fear for your children, don't you, at times? You fear for them. You hurt for your children. You do everything you can to protect your kids from danger. You repeat those warnings to your kids over and over and over and over, and what do they do? They roll their eyes at you. You do that because why? You love them and you want to preserve them from any danger. You pray that their lives will be free of difficulty, that that God would give them success. You would never want anything like what is being described in this passage to ever happen to one of your children. I remember one time when we lived in Arizona, some of you have heard this story, but most of you haven't. And we used to repeat to our kids, Melena and Taylor, over and over and over and over again. They would take all the cushions off of the, the um, love seat. And the, 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 we had this over, we, had a, we bought all this oversized furniture when that was really cool. Uh, and it was cool for about you know, like five months. And we bought it in that five month time frame. And it was just horrible. It's horrible to try to move out of your house and move in. And, uh, it's terrible. But we've all this oversized furniture. The kids used to love to take all the cushions off, and then they would jump onto the cushions and everything. We kept telling them to stop doing that because what would inevitably happen is Taylor would end up somehow underneath of the cushions while Milena was jumping off. Well, that happened one too many times. And hey, uh, Haler, I, I keep calling that kid Haler all the time. And Taylor, she, uh, yeah, that's Haley and Taylor mixed together there. That's, that's the new one and the middle one. And, and so Milena jumps off. And all of a sudden, we hear this scream. Ah! And Missy goes, Taylor broke her leg. I just know it. And I went, she's fine. And so we walked over and we got her up. And <laughs> Missy goes, I'm telling you, Andrew, we need to take her to the ER. And I said, she's fine. Don't worry about it. I said, set her down the ground and let her walk over to me. So Missy sets her on the ground and she walks over to me. <laughs> and I picked her up and said, see, she's fine. She can walk. And we did this for a whole week where she's limping on this leg just terribly, just terribly limping on it. So Friday comes around, and they'd done this on a Sunday, a Sunday night, I think it was. Friday comes rolling around, and we go on a hike, because we lived in Arizona. You hike in Arizona. We go on this hike. And all of a sudden, about an hour into it, Taylor goes, Daddy, my leg hurts so bad. Can you carry me? And I went, oh, geez, yeah, sure. So I pick her up, and I carry her. We get home, and Missy goes, I'm taking her to the ER, and you don't have a choice in it this time. I said, okay. So Missy takes her. I told Missy I was going to use her, my, my voice I use for Missy. I haven't used it yet. Uh, but anyways, she, you know, because all of us men, we all have a voice for our wife, don't we? Yeah, I'm taking her to the hospital. I'm just gonna. So she, she takes the kid to the hospital. She comes home, and I'm sitting on the couch, and I know what's coming because she comes in. She's got a smile on her face. I don't know. This is not a funny issue to me. So afterwards, go down there and tell her this isn't funny. She comes in, she goes, I told you, it's broken. Now, my kid walked on her broken leg for an entire week because of me. I felt terrible. Now I'm going to connect this back to what we're actually talking about. I felt terrible. I hurt for her. When I realized I've had a broken bone before, I know the pain that goes along with that and everything else. And I began to hurt for my daughter. And I thought, man, I wish that was me because here's this little two-year-old with a cast on her leg. Thankfully, it was only a half cast. She figured out how to run with this half cast on. She figured out how to hike and everything with a half cast on. She was amazing. But I hurt for her, and I, didn't, I wanted to take that cast off of her and put it on myself because I didn't want her to be going through that, that whole thing. And that is the heart of a parent, isn't it? Isn't that the heart of a parent? We want to take any little thing that happens to our kids and we want to bring it on to ourselves. And you see a passage like this. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. And you have to look at a passage and you have to look at this passage this way and you have to say, what could be so powerful, so motivating in the heart of God that he would be willing, even find pleasure in subjecting his son to this horrible thing? What could it be in the heart of God that would allow him to do that? And the answer is this, and I don't think I put it in your notes, but I want you to write it down anyways. And I want you to hear what I'm about to say because this is really brings us all together. The answer is this. You ready? Love. Love. Magnificent, faithful, joyous, redeeming love. 
But you say, Andrew, how do you even know that? I mean, how do you know it's love? Because of one simple yet very profound passage of Scripture in the Bible. The most famous verse in the Bible, even if this is your first time in church in your entire life, you probably at least know this reference. If you watch football, you see it in the end zone almost every Sunday. It's this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but what? have eternal life. God so loved the world that he would be willing to do this radical thing to give his son. You see, God looked at this broken world. He looked at us, broken inside, now separated in relationship to him. The one thing that we were created for in life, the one thing we were created for in life, and God was so full of love, so full of grace, so full of compassion, and he was not willing for the world and for us to stay in that state. That's love, folks. That's love. And because of the nature of sin, we're unable to help ourselves. Because of our nature and sin, we're unable to help ourselves. We're unable to escape this dilemma that grips all of our hearts. We're unable to fix the world. So God had to move on our behalf, didn't he? He had to move on our behalf. God so loved the world that what? He gave. He gave. No, God doesn't find pleasure in those particular moments of the suffering of a son. He finds pleasure in what that suffering would result in. This is, bottom line, a story of magnificent love. And I want to just say it again to you. Love we could never achieve or earn or deserve. It must be given as a gracious gift. God loved us this much, folks. As he stretched out his arms upon a cross, God loved us this much that he'd be willing to subject his son to unthinkable things. Why? Because that one death, that one death would give us life and would give life to many. And folks, there, there's the plan. There's the plan. Now maybe you're sitting here thinking this morning, oh Andrew, I understand this. I've heard this before. I've heard this a million times. Every time I come to church, I feel like this is what I hear. Why are you putting so much emphasis on this this morning? Well, here's why. Because maybe sometime next week, or sometime in this next year, or sometime in this next month, you will, in some circumstance, in some location, some relationship, you're going to be tempted to doubt the love of God. You're going to be tempted to doubt the love of God. Maybe it'll be a moment of physical suffering, and you're going to wonder why God has allowed the pain in your experience. Maybe it'll be in the midst of something very, very significant, relational disappointment. Somebody that you love has turned their back on you, and you wonder, why is God allowing all of this stuff to happen in your life? Maybe it'll be in a moment of financial difficulty. You've sought to obey God. you sought to be a good steward of the resources that he's given you, but you lost your job, and it just doesn't make any sense to you at all. Or maybe just look around at the world you live in, and as you look at the world around you, it would have seemed and it would appear that the evil is prospering. And you wonder, where is God? Where is his love? And this is your argument. This is the place to run because not only does the giving of Christ argue for the magnificence of God's love, but it argues that he will continually love you. Let me read for you Romans in chapter 8. I want you to hear these words. They'll be on the screen. Hear these words. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Now, you've got to understand Paul's logic in this, in, in this uh, verse here. Paul is the author of this. Paul is the, the, the great missionary of the, of the New Testament, spread the message of Jesus really further than almost anybody else ever did, ever did. And he wrote most of the New Testament. And here's Paul's logic. If God would do this radical thing, 
Offer his son to cruel suffering and death. Notice the two words in Isaiah 53. It pleased the Lord to crush him, to bring him to grief. Crushing has to do with that physical suffering of Christ. Every moment, and listen to what I'm going to say here. You need to understand this. Because every moment of Christ's life, every moment of Christ's life was physical suffering. Every moment. He didn't just suffer on the cross. His whole life was one of suffering. The manger began Jesus' suffering. He suffered every day as he subjected himself to the harsh realities of life in a fallen world. But there was emotional suffering as well. That's the grief word. He was despised and rejected, and that emotional suffering reached this crescendo when as he's hanging on the cross, he, he looks out and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that terrible moment where the father turns his back on his son, all of that grief comes to a head. Now, Paul is arguing if God would subject Christ, willingly give Christ in that way to us, will he not also give us everything that we need? It would make no sense, listen, it would make no sense for God to do this radical thing and turn his back on you in your moment of need. That would make no redemption logic whatsoever. And so Paul argues that your guarantee that God will be faithful to you. He will be with you and in you and for you and meet all of your needs as you walk through life toward eternity. Your guarantee is the cross of Jesus Christ. If God did this for you, he will meet all of your needs. Now, we need to talk about this for just a moment, okay? Because you and I have this terrible problem with this word need, don't we? We have this terrible problem with this word need. We load all kinds of things onto our needs list, don't we? We have this huge long list. I can go to some of your Amazon accounts and see what your wish list is, and you think you need those things. We load all kinds of things onto our needs list, and they're not needs. Paul is not arguing in Romans 8 that God is going to sign your wish list for you, but your Creator knows what you need, and He is totally committed to meet all of those needs. So we don't have to be afraid, do we? We don't have to be afraid. You do not have to play out all the what-ifs in your mind that we tend to do. You do not have to figure out the sovereignty of God. You don't have to figure that out. There are moments in life when God is going to confuse you, isn't it? There are moments when when, when things are going to come along your way and you're going to be confused. David had one of those in in Psalm 13. He says, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Sometimes it's confusing the things that that God has brought into your life. Listen, you will never find heart rest, calm, and peace, and security of heart. Hear what I'm about to say. By means of understanding. Because there are things that God will do in your life that you will not understand. Tim Keller argues that the importance of believing in the sovereignty of God is not that the doctrine will make life make sense to you. The importance of believing in the sovereignty of God is precisely because life won't make sense to you. And so I have a place to run, don't I? I have a place to run. I have an argument to give in those moments when it just doesn't seem like God is hearing me, when he seems distant, when I'm confused about what he's brought into my life, when I'm looking at, at the life of someone else and that life seems so much easier than my life, when an enemy is whispering in my ear, hey, hey you, where's your God now? Where is God now? I have an argument to give. You see, I open my Bible and I go to Isaiah 53.10. I go to Romans 8.32 and I say, if God would do this for me, If God would send his only son to this this earth to die for me, to take my place for me, then he's going to meet all my needs. He's going to meet all of my needs. Now, I want to ask you some pastoral questions this morning because 
Well, that's what you're supposed to do as a pastor. So let me ask you, this is the first one in your notes. Write it down. Do you have rest in your heart? Write it down. Do you have rest in your heart? I mean, really. Let's get down to it. Be honest. Do you? Do you live with peace? Even in moments when it doesn't seem like the circumstances that you're in are peaceful? Do you have a stability and security that's not related to the issues of the moment? Do you torment yourself with an endless list of questions that you're not able to answer? Do you wish that you had more control than you have now? Perhaps you've not understood the full implications of this season that we're celebrating right now. Perhaps you don't understand it all. It is the ultimate demonstration. This Christmas season is the ultimate demonstration of faithful love. And if God would give his son in this way, will he not also deliver you everything that you need? This is the place where rest of heart can be found. And you know, there's some of you, there's some of you, as, I'm, as, as I've asked that question, your honest confession would have to be this, I don't have rest. I don't have rest. You see, folks, this, the story of Jesus in a manger, this is your place of rest. Now back to Isaiah 53. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely when you make him a guilt offering. We talked about that's the plan. The plan was that the second Adam had to come. The first Adam failed the test and the second Adam had to come. Now, let me just take a second because as I wrote that, as I was studying that last night, I realized that not all of you are going to understand what I mean by the first Adam and the second Adam. So the first Adam is obviously Adam in the Bible. When, When Adam was created, he was created for a reason, wasn't he? He was to be perfect. He was to go about life perfect. He wasn't supposed to bring sin into the world as he did, for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. The first Adam failed. And so Jesus throughout Scripture is known when he comes as that baby in a manger, he is known as the second Adam. And he had to be perfect. Just like the first Adam was supposed to be perfect, Jesus had to be perfect because he's the second Adam. So Jesus was that second Adam. And he had to be willing to live in the middle of the harsh realities and the temptations of life in a fallen world. But he had to be willing to be obedient in every single way, in every thought, in every desire, in every word, and in every action. He must be obedient. So as he goes to the cross, he is then known as the perfect Lamb of God who can now carry our sin, satisfy the anger of God so that we would receive forgiveness so that we could have acceptance into the family of God, righteousness given to us through Christ, and then through that we're given eternal life. And listen, folks, that's the plan. Do you see the story of Christmas now? Is it starting to make sense to you? You know, we come year after year after year after year after year, and we hear Christmas stories, and we hear about the shepherds, and we hear about the wise men, and we hear about this baby in a manger, but we're only getting half the story. It's like picking up a novel and starting it in the middle instead of starting it at the beginning. We have to understand that this Jesus had to come for a reason, There was a reason. And yeah, we talk about the reason at Christmas, but I don't think we really understand it. And so we see that Jesus came and he came as the plan. We had a problem. We as people, we have a problem that we can't solve and it's called sin. You can't escape it in yourself. You can't. You can't defeat it. You can't redeem the world from its fallenness. We have to be rescued. And that's why the promise of a Savior is so precious. And so from day one, from day one, that little baby was destined to die. Listen, I put this in your notes. The cross isn't a moment of defeat. The cross is not an interruption The cross of Jesus Christ was the plan. 
cross of Jesus Christ was the plan. He came to be the lamb. He came to be the offering that would satisfy God's anger. For this result, he shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. That in that one cruel death, life would be given to many. That there would be a great worldwide family of every language group and every location of the globe, of every period of history who would be given new life through the death of his son and he would have offspring like the sands of the sea. What a plan. One death. What a plan. One death. Innumerable lives are being given. Isaiah 53 goes on and says, and he shall prolong his days. Now to the Hebrew person, Long life was a sure sign of blessing. It's a sure sign of blessing. And this little phrase, he shall prolong his days, is a hint that the death of Jesus wasn't the end of the story, that he would live on. Surely a prediction of his resurrection, but it's also a prediction of another kind. It's a prediction of another thing, that Jesus would live on in the hearts of many that he gives new life to, new life as a person. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but what? Say it with me. No longer I who lives, but what? Christ who lives in me. He gives life to many. And then finally it says, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. What a great phrase. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. When God placed this mission in the hands of God, he put it in good hands, didn't he? Put it in good hands. Jesus would be faithful. He would do everything that the Father asked him to do. And in so doing, would provide for us not only eternal life, but would provide for us eternal hope. Jesus was faithful. Jesus was willing. Never for even a brief moment was his heart fickle. Never for a brief moment did he reconsider. He accepted this severe job description with joy, and through him, God's work prospers. Now, I don't know. I don't know, and it's probably a good thing that I don't. But I don't know all the things that you brought into this room with you this morning. I don't know all the things, all the junk you've brought with you in this room this morning. I don't know the hardships that many of you are facing right now. I don't know the grief that is in your heart. I don't know the temptations that you struggle with, but I do know that you'll be tempted to wonder, where is God and what is he doing? I do know that there's an enemy who would whisper in your ear, where is your God now? You've obeyed, you've done all of these things, you've obeyed for this, for this? Hey, hey Andrew, Eric, John, Jack, I don't know all your names here this morning. Where's that thing called grace? Hey, where is that power that you talk about? Isaiah 53.10 can arm you in those moments, can it? Can arm you in those moments. God's love is magnificent. God's love is faithful so powerful, so willing that he would be pleased to give his son to cruel suffering and cruel death so that we would know life. And if he would do such a thing, I put this in your notes, if he would do such a thing, is it conceivable that he would abandon abandon you in your no moment of need? And the answer is no, he will not. He will not. You see, rest won't be found in understanding. Rest won't be found in understanding. Rest is found in the pleasure of the Father and in the willingness of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no more clear-pointed, rest-giving demonstration of love of God for you than the gift of His Son. I would plead with you in your moment of doubt or in your moment of fear or in your moment of hurt, or in your moment of discouragement, don't run from the one. Don't run from him. Run to him. Run towards that magnificent love of that baby who was sent in a manger who was destined to die. Why? So that you could have life 
so that you could have rest, so that you could have peace in your heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, God. And Father, we thank you for it's the life that you give us through your son. And Father, really, as we look at this passage of Scripture this morning, as we talk about Isaiah 53.10, that it brought pleasure to the Father. But Father, why did it bring pleasure to you? Because you knew the end result. The suffering of your Son, that didn't bring you pleasure. What brought you pleasure was the result that Jesus gave us life. That he gave us life abundantly. That through his life, we could have greater life. That through his life, we could have eternal life. And it's a radical thing. It's a radical thing to think that that baby in a manger was sent to this earth for a mission, for a purpose, that he was destined to die from the moment he was born. That little baby. But Father, through that death gave us eternal life. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, Andrew, I, I've never received that free gift of salvation. I've never come into that relationship of, of knowing Jesus. And this morning, I see the plan. The plan was that Jesus came for me. The plan was that if I would open my heart to this baby in a manger who came and died on a cross for my sin, was buried but rose again to give me life, and that through his life coming into my life would give me eternal life. Andrew, I want that. I understand that today. And if you're sitting here and you're saying, Andrew, I I know right now I need a relationship with Jesus. Remember, we're not talking about religion here. We're talking about a relationship to God. That we can walk with God. That we can talk with God. That we don't have to do any kind of religious practices, but that we can step boldly, as Hebrews says, boldly into the presence of God whenever we need to, whenever we want to. And maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, Andrew, I want that today. I want to follow the plan of Jesus. Would you just pray with me, just quiet in your heart. Just say, Father, I need your son, Jesus. And right now, I'm asking him to come into my life, to save me from all of my sins. Thank you, God, for that baby in a manger who came to die for me so that I could have life and through the resurrection of Jesus I could be resurrected to life if you just prayed that prayer would you take that tear off we asked you to fill out the beginning would you fill that out for us would you just mark on the back of that that you're accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior today we're excited for you we want to help you on this journey of knowing and understanding what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Father we thank you so much for the plan that you put in place so that we all could have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Father, we thank you for the promise of that passage of scripture. We thank you. God, we thank you for how you bless us in our life and how you take care of us and how you take care of our needs, God.